The BMW E36 M3 was the poster child of the fast car and max power generations for the best part of two decades. But what if you could have the same engine and chassis for half the price? It's a 328 Touring! So the E36 had big shoes to fill and a tough act to follow when it finally emerged in 1990 and was released to the public in 1991. Now obviously they did the full range of every kind of body style you can think of, the coupe, the four-door saloon, in fact the coupe is kind of a saloon as well really, um, the convertible, and here we have the Touring and of course the M3, the all-powerful, almighty M3. But I would argue the 328i is actually the one to go for because this almost gives you as much performance as an M3, but in a much more discreet package that no one's gonna spot. It's a real Q car. And I need to say a huge thank you to Stone Cold Classics at Rotem in Kent. Please check out their website, which is in the description below. Now, from the outside, this car might not look too special, but this is the M52 straight six fantastic classic BMW engine. In this car, the 328i, this engine makes 190 horsepower and 280 newton meters of torque. In the M3, it's hardly any more. That only gets 213 and 320, so 23 horsepower more, which is not a lot. Bear in mind, an M3 is gonna cost you at least double what this did. You're only getting another 23 horsepower and 43 newton meters of torque. Is it worth spending that much money on, I wonder? when you can probably map it and add filters and things to get pretty close to that. And this engine is just glorious. The sound of this thing is almost unique. It's that crisp growl. It's not a burble like a V8. It's so different from a four cylinder. It's the straight six and the BMW straight six is something special. Well, this car has only got 79,000 miles on it, which is barely run in, frankly, for a decent car like this. This car was pretty highly optioned when it was new, so it's got the full leather absolutely everywhere, and these seats look slightly patina. They don't look worn at all. There's a little bit of discoloration, but you know, bear in mind, this car is now 21 years old. That's actually pretty good going. The whole interior just looks fantastic, really. The leather treatment extends to these nice door cards as well, and to complement the uh, whole tan and caramel effect, we've also got these kind of very 90s plastic wood walnut inserts around the dashboard, the door handles, this trim area around the gear stick, and these knobs and things, although the gear knob has slightly cracked now, which is a shame. This is full on 90s BMW at its best. We've got our business RDS radio. Why, do, why is radio taking care of business? Do they only play Elvis on these things or something? I don't know. And this also goes back to the time when BMW were focusing everything on the driver in their cockpit style design. If you look at this, this panel of the center console curves towards the driver and even the gear shift is slightly angled in towards the driver as well. It makes for a, the ultimate driving experience. This is back when BMWs really were trying to be the ultimate driving experience and to a fair degree they were kind of winning it. Below your radio cassette, your business radio cassette, we've got a button for literally everything. You've got your Air up, air face, air down, air auto, temperature up and down, dual zone climate. Dual zone climate wasn't common in the 90s really, unless you're very, very, very high end. So someone paid a fair bit extra for that. I'm guessing there's a name that sounds businessy um, on the spec sheet for that. Defrost of something or other, recirculate and rear heater, rear he front heated window, or front demist, I should say, it's not a heated window, and rear demist. Now below all that, we've got possibly the most confusing computer I've ever seen in a car. There are, there are 18 buttons on this panel, um, and many of them are abbreviated as well. So, ideal for keeping your eyes on the road whilst concentrating on a scary hairpin. Maybe, I don't know. But you've got your fuel consumption, your fuel rage, your temp, your code apparently, your limit and speed, your disc, your timer, your check, your KMM lols, miles. Uh, this one, I am utterly baffled, oh, memo, I thought it said me slash mo. No, it's memo and set res. Wow, thousand, hundred, ten, one. This is like a game of countdown on this thing. Now here we've got four electric windows all the way around the car. That's kind of nice. And an electric sunroof up here as well. Oh, looking in the glove box, this is a nice accessory you don't often find. The original BMW torch, which doesn't actually work, unfortunately, but it looks lovely. Got the BMW logo on it, two little pins in there. Oh, all the time it's in the car, that's charging. I wonder if you can get a new battery for that. That would be so cool to have that working. 
and also in here double cup holder because people used to have picnics in the car in the old days why don't we have cup holders in the glove box anymore i'll miss that one thing you haven't got on this side of the car is an airbag you have one on the driver's side because that was new and exciting and kind of the law but nothing on the passenger side because it wasn't the law yet now apart from your little cubby hole for the uh, your glasses and things here you've got a little tray here and obviously you've got an ashtray because everything did back then and a nice alarm rest holder for you also a lever did i mention the electric windows all the way around sitting in the driver's seat it is the perfect driving machine and all that your seats are actually on both sides i thought it would be the driver's side but it is both front seats are i think about six way adjustable possibly even more if i keep on hunting uh your forwards backwards up down tilt the back i think yeah these headrests can be raised and tilted forward and backwards as well you are going to get the ideal driving position somehow and the steering wheel goes up and down as well which is nice it has that kind of cockpit fighter plane feel you got from bmws for a couple of generations a while ago where everything even the vents are kind of facing into you the wheel is in your face everything is just fired at you and it makes you want to drive and we've got the classic instrument binnacle that bmw used to use in absolutely everything before it was all digital readouts with that downward hanging reverse needle that swings down and goes from 50 or 70 mpg mythically on the far left and as you accelerate harder and harder it goes and buries itself on the far right up into the top of the ceiling and goes round again if you keep on accelerating hard enough because at the bottom of the speedo we've got the the multiple led the five the five greens then to amber then to red led showing how close you are to a service if it gets that red one you know you're in trouble Something always struck me as odd about BMWs back this time, if I don't know if they still do it now, is that door speakers are absolutely tiny. But they do sound very good, so I guess they must know what they were doing. Being the 328i, we've got a few M Sport parts from the factory. We have the gear knob, which is an M style one, and the steering wheel, which is M, -M as well. Mm. I'm not sure if these door skirts are M style, but they certainly are a bit more than the basic boring range of, of skirts that you get on some of these cars. I think they are M Sports side skirts. In the back of the car, we've got another walnut ashtray and uh, not bad legroom really, it's not the best, but it's okay. But big armchair seats in the back there. And of course, it's a touring, so lots of space. Let's go take a look at that. You forget how much cars have grown in the last two decades because back in the 90s, this was a fairly big medium-sized car. But compared to say, I don't know, Mini Clubman, this isn't that big. I mean, it doesn't look a lot bigger, to be honest. But the great thing about that is that these lines are elegant and smooth and delicate. With this one, unfortunately, you do lose the Hofmeister kink in the back window because it can't do it really. Um, but it doesn't look bulky here in the back corner. This is quite a nice solution here as the lines just come together and the back end kind of folds around what is a fairly generous boot. We can't miss this twin exhaust this is factory standard this isn't even an upgrade this just looks and sounds fabulous and it came from the factory that way okay this isn't the biggest boot in the world and i'll be honest it's not the most practically shaped because it's wide at the front it gets narrow between the wheel arches which really does get very narrow indeed and actually rises up over the rear axle and differential so so it's not the most practical of load luggers really now i know i hate um, those little pump up sticky goo replacement packs you get for spare wheels but this has got a full size spare wheel in it and it absolutely takes up the entire boot along with the battery if they would go for a space saver in this car if that had been such a thing back then you could have got a fair degree more more luggage in the back of this car whatever that is in centimeters that's that much and you could have made it that much now for me the star of this whole car is that glorious engine. It just sounds like nothing else. It kind of purrs in the background while you're at rest. And the moment you put your foot down, it goes to a roar. It wouldn't take much in way of modifications in terms of an air filter, an exhaust pipe, uh, maybe a remap. And you've got this car up into M3 territory. Oh, I don't know if you can see that on any cameras at all, but there is oh, a new Aston Martin nipping around the roundabout. Glorious. 
Now obviously this doesn't have the same damper settings and springs and things as the M3 car does, but you've got the same basic chassis and if you were of a mind to do such a thing, you could quite easily turn this into an M3 with M3 suspension parts, M3 steering rack. Now the steering on this car at low speed starts out fairly heavy, but as the speed picks up it uh, remains fairly heavy. Lock to lock, it's actually not too bad. On the E30, unless you had like a, a 318 IS or an actual M3, the lock to lock was about 19 or 20 turns of the wheel. You could be like steering a galleon at sea trying to get around a corner. This is far tighter. I will demonstrate on this otherwise straight bit of road. Now, you probably noticed at that point, there is a fair degree of body roll in the car. This is because this is set up for comfort rather than out and out performance. It's a family car after all, it's a wagon, you're gonna have the spaniels in the back. Those wheels are fairly wide on the car, so there's a bit of road noise coming into it, and a touch of wind noise from the, um, from the A post as well. Overall, it's not too bad. Glancing in the rear view mirror, I've just realized where the big speakers are. They're actually in the ceiling above the boot. A really unusual spot for a set of loud speakers to be, but I assume it works well. Hang on, I'll turn the radio on. Oh no, I can't, I've got a code for it. There is a code in the book pack. There's absolutely everything with this car. But it's only got 79,000 miles. I think it might be one owner from the, after the first six months, so like two owners. And so it's all incredibly original and very, very straight indeed. It's been cared for by someone who's actually looked after their car very, very well its entire life. Once again, I need to say a huge thank you to Stone Cold Classics at Rotem in Kent for the loan of the car so I can do this little review. Please check out their website, which is in the description below. Have a look at their stock list because it's always something exciting to go and have a look at. And quite a few things I'd like to buy myself, if I'm honest. Now, the chassis on this car is the same as every other E36, and it's surprisingly good. It, unlike some of those teen movies you watched 20 years ago and absolutely adored, and when you go back and put them on again, you realize the old VHS quality was masking a few deficiencies. This actually lives up to the hype more than perhaps the E30 does, dare I say it. After 10 years of development, 1981 to 1991, they were putting the plans together for this car, so they had plenty of time to get things right. They built on the knowledge they learned from the E30 and improved it in almost every way. Sure, the E30 is a fabulous, raw experience, but this is actually more drivable and more usable. It's less likely to throw you into a hedge if you make a mistake. Although, when these were new, seeing these backwards in a hedge on a frosty morning was a fairly common thing, to be honest. So the chassis is really quite lithe and nimble. It does encourage you to put your toe down perhaps more than you probably ought to on a nice twisty country lane. When you need to make a quick getaway, this car has absolutely got the beans to do it. It really does feel confident, a little bit aggressive, that you want to drive it hard, it wants to be driven hard. And if there's any company that understands heritage and the longevity of design, BMW really is it. Looking around this car, there are elements of cars gone by and there are elements of cars from today even. This is 21 years, or 30 years actually since this thing was actually released. 40 years since it was designed initially. And that's a shocking thing to say, isn't it? This car was designed in 1981. That's nearly 40 years ago, but it's only a 20-year-old car gives you some idea of the life cycle of design and the life cycle of car production. But it's all in perspective really, doesn't it? <clears throat> yeah, if I'm going to have to be critical, and it's a review, so I really ought to be, the brakes are powerful but they're a little bit wooden, and the gear shift isn't quite as precise as I would like it to be. BMWs, I expect to have a very, very tight gate that you can almost telepathically move from one gear to the next. This is just a tiny bit notchy, but that's me absolutely hunting for flaws on this thing. The real leather steering wheel feels nice in your hands. The leather seat under your bum feels really pleasant as well. It's a nice thing. I've not spent long getting this exactly right, but uh, it's very nice and the leather feels good as well. The wooden gear knob perhaps feels a little more plastic than wood, if I'm honest. But you know, that's one of the most easily changeable parts of an entire car, really. It feels very compact, actually. It doesn't feel like a big car at all, which is surprising because it is a you know, fairly, fairly big footprint. I have to admit, looking at this car, and looking at the M3. I'm one of those weird people who actually really likes station wagons, estate cars, long roofs. I can't stop saying long roof. People hate that for some reason. 
but I just love the shape of these things. M3 wheels, M3 body kit, M3 suspension in this car would actually virtually be my perfect BMW. I love the angular design from the 90s and I love the M3's sort of low stance and harsh looks, but I want it in this body shape. They never made it though. They never made an M3 estate, so the 328i is the closest you're ever gonna get. This is one of the rare occurrences of the automotive full house, the, the flush, the straight flush, rear wheel drive, manual gearbox, straight six, normally aspirated, and a wagon. This is everything you could possibly want. And throw in the creature comforts of, you know, air conditioning and electric windows and a sunroof, this is really as good as it gets. And what more can you actually want, seriously? I mean, maybe throw in cruise control if you're being extra picky, but I don't really use it that much, to be honest. The great thing about a car of this age is that it's old enough that it looks totally different from everything else on the road. It really does stand out as something unique. But at the same time, because it's a 328i, not an M car, it doesn't look flashy and showy like you're trying too hard. Um, and it's also, it's new enough that you could use it every day if you really wanted to, or if you just want to save it for the weekends and days out and things. It's just gathering money in your garage because cars like this are an investment really, aren't they? They're never going to be made like this again. This may well be loaded with tech, you know, electric windows, aircon, ABS, airbags, traction control, all that kind of safety equipment. But it's got none of the nanny stuff. It leaves you to it, lets you drive the car itself. In a few years' time, cars will be so far departed from this, this will be something really special. Well, we've just rolled up behind the absolute polar opposite antithesis to this car. It's a Renault Zoe, basically an electric Clio, which makes no noise, is front wheel drive, is very clean and is the future. The thing is, this dinosaur is so much more fun. I hope you've enjoyed coming out for a drive in a 1998 328i Touring, because I sure have. This car is for sale at Stone Cold Classics. Uh, I'm gonna go and check my credit card balance and it might not be for much longer. I really do like it quite a lot. Please hit like, please hit subscribe, please hit that little bell notification down. I think it's in that corner. I always get this wrong when I'm pointing at the camera. Uh, and that will tell you when I put up something new and exciting for your delectation. Tune in next time. Thanks for watching. Really, this does not feel like a 21-year-old car. It doesn't rattle. It doesn't creak. In fact, one little tiny creak. I think it's leather, actually, though. The only thing I can hear is really when I'm just idling at 40 miles an hour is a bit of wind noise and a bit of road noise. The engine's barely making a whisper.